And so imagine in the first century in Galatia, and um, we've got these uh, two worlds colliding, haven't we? These two cultures that are merging. Uh, we, we have passionate Jews who are steeped in the law. And mixed with them, we have these new Gentile converts who are babes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And their backgrounds and cultures are completely different. You know, we've got the Jews who have the Mishnah and their traditions and customs. And, and then with them, the Gentiles, who've just heard the simple yet unbelievable hope that there is in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the Jews want the Gentiles, or some of the Jews want the Gentiles to, to take on their customs and traditions and practices. And the Gentiles, quite, quite frankly, don't understand it, let alone want to adhere to it, or certainly many of them. And so and all these atoms have now collided to become quite a vibrant and, and through persecution, toxic environment in Galatia. And we find... As we read through Galatians, the Spirit is, is at pains to point out that this ecclesia, or these ecclesias in Galatia, are really on a knife edge. It could go either way. They have gone back into the womb, as Galatians 4 verse 19 uh, has said. <coughs> and so it's critical in, in chapter 1 of Galatians that we've just read through Brother Jordan. It's critical for the basis of truth to be established that removes out of its way the upbringing, the cultural bias, the baggage that came with it, the preconceived ideas uh, that many had. And this is what Galatians does. It's not a general letter. It's a a letter dealing with this one problem and has the one singular purpose of unifying Jew and Gentile together. Uh, And and if you just come to chapter 3 and verse 28, we have there recorded three aspects that that need to be joined together and work as a harmony and, and a unity Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And Galatians deals with the first two of those things. It deals with the Jew and the Gentile coming together. It deals with the bond and the free. We'll pick up that in in the fourth session with uh, the son of the bond woman and the the son of the free woman. The sons and heirs in chapter 4. And then male and female, well it doesn't get mentioned at all in Galatians. That's not a problem, it would appear, in Galatia. That's dealt with in Ephesians, isn't it, and 1 Corinthians 11. So we just deal in Galatians with these uh, first two things. So the starting point, really, for the Spirit, as it's writing through Paul, is to break down the traditions and the commandments of men and cast them aside so that both Jews and Gentiles can build from the same foundation of the law and the prophets with the Lord Jesus Christ as, as the cornerstone. Uh, And Galatians, as we'll pick up as we go through, particularly tomorrow, it's really all about how to view Moses and the law and how to view Abraham and the promise. Uh, And these two characters and their stories, Moses and Abraham, come together in Galatians as they do, uh, I guess, in Romans and Hebrews as well. And if we just, you know, if we just look at Galatians 6, verse 11, um, it says there, you see how large a letter (coughs) I've written unto you. Uh, with mine own hand. And, and those observant w- would observe that it's not a big letter, is it? Uh, and it's the same word used, for example, in Hebrews 7, verse 4, concerning uh, Melchizedek. And it says, now, co- have, now consider how great this man was, and to whom even a- the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoil. It's speaking of a greatness. It is speaking of a weightiness, a, a deepness to the principles recorded in this letter. And it's not an easy epistle to go through. There's some challenging allegories, there's some hard discourses, some deep principles and soul-searching exhortation. And so really this is all about status uh, and and not size. And what we'll pick up from verse 6 of Galatians 1 um, is almost an exasperation, isn't there? A a disappointment uh, in Galatians 1 verse 6 to to, to the Ecclesias in Galatia. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, unto another gospel. And and so what we pick up here is that Paul has recently visited Galatia and had a great success in establishing the ecclesias there, made up of Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, all believing the one true gospel. But since he left Galatia, very quickly the the troublers, the perverters, the leaven, they're the the descriptions, the Judaizers had come in uh, and, and through persecution sent these new babes in Christ backwards in their journey. They've they've become removed from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a matter that it's happened quickly. I marvel that you're so soon 
removed. <clears throat> and the Judaizers wanted, didn't they, in, in, this, in these ecclesias, to maintain a, a religious and a racial superiority. And the only way to do so was to insist via persecution uh, on strict observance of the law of Moses and circumcision in particular. Because that was the one covenant, wasn't it, between God and the Jews only and exclusively. Uh, and therefore the only thing that they, they had to lean on, really, to maintain any form of separation, any form of superiority, and to maintain uh, the pride that they had in their Jewishness. But ironically, we won't go there, but John 5 verse 46 uh, and Luke 16 verse 31 actually <coughs> confirmed that, that the Judaizers didn't even listen to Moses. Um, so this wasn't necessarily genuine. So who were they? Well, John 5, I think it is, verse 45 says, There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. So it's those who were um, what we call the Judaizers, those who uh, trusted in Moses. Uh, John 9, verse 31 says, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. And so this is separation between those following Moses and those who have come into the new covenant. Uh, and Acts 15, we'll pick up on this tomorrow, the Jerusalem conference in particular, um, says this. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. But there rose up, this is verse 5 now, certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 24 says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law. And we'll, we'll see tomorrow that this is at the same time that uh, Galatians was written, or we think it might be. Uh, and so it's those who are insisting on circumcision by Moses and also the keeping of the law, and that that was a requirement for salvation. That was really the trigger. That was really the problem, wasn't it? Uh, and those troublers there highlighted, uh, those that troubled you, we come across that phrase in those passages in Galatians, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Chapter five, 5, verse 10 and 12, and then chapter 6, verse 17. That's their description. They were kind of the Achan of the New Testament. They're the troublers um, of, of Israel. But if you come to chapter 2 and verse 4, um, we, we, we kind of added a little detail on who these people were that were infiltrating into the ecclesia to try and send particularly the Gentile Christians, but also the Jewish Christians, back to the law and to circumcision. And, and it turns out to be quite... Um, a schemed plan. So ch chapter 2, verse 4, which is um, likely to be Acts 15 territory, um, says, And there, because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So brethren brought in to spy out their liberty. And then chapter 2, verse 12, also says, For before that certain came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those of the circumcision. So there's kind of a, a fear culture from this persecution. But, but notice there, those who have brought in unawares. And what was their intention? Well, chapter 2, verse 4, has just said, it was to spy out their liberty. And, and that idea to spy out, it's, it's only used here. There's no other occurrences of the word. And it means to inspect or to view Closely, In other words, they really got to grips with the gospel message, the Christian practices, so that they could unbuild it and take it to pieces. And notice the careful wording. To spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into bondage. So, so to take someone's argument to pieces, you first need to fully understand it, to find out what foundation it stands upon. And that's what these people were doing, so that they could then dismantle it bit by bit. And it was actually working. And, and this is therefore a deliberate and a thought three plan, wasn't it? This wasn't a few uh, disgruntled Jews that were brought in deliberately. There were people planted in the ecclesia, those who people then went through the minute detail of the gospel to then bring these people back into bondage. And to assist with that, so to force the Jew, Jewish and Gentile Christians to observe the law, and to go back into bondage, the Judaizers persecuted them in the same way that chapter 1 that we've just read says Paul used to do. In chapter 1, verse 13, you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. So he says, I was one of them. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church, the ecclesia of God, and wasted it. Verse 23, 
but they heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. So these Judaizers, Paul, Paul knows them. You know, P- Paul was one of them. He was one of the persecuting powers that is now being persecuted by his equals, who they, who, who are the, those who used to be his equals. So P- Paul is the one, isn't he? He's experienced both sides of the fence. You know, look at chapter 5, verse 11. He, he's at pains to say that. The Spirit guided, he says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the, the offence of the cross. See, so Paul is now saying, I was persecuting. Now I'm being persecuted. And that, that change was because of the gospel message. And it was the same for the Galatians. He's saying to them, look, you need to suffer the persecution. That's what happens to the people of God. And, and so this was the tactics used to bring them back into bondage. Chapter 4, verse 17 says, They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would have exclude you. These are kind of the bullying tactics of the Judaizers. They would exclude you, leave you out, that ye might affect them. And then the allegory of chapter 4, verse 29 and 30, shows that the children of the flesh, the Ishmaels, are persecuted by, uh, sorry, are persecuting, I should say, um, the children of promise, the Isaacs. And so it was in Galatia. Ishmael was there and Isaac was there. And Paul's giving birth to them, and he says, I'm not sure what I'm giving birth to, whether it's Isaac or Ishmael uh, that's coming out of the womb. And so the Judaizers were persecuting the Gentile Christians. And Paul was Ishmael, wasn't he, when he persecuted them? But he has now become Isaac uh, through his conversion. And and his appeal is that they would go through that same uh, process. Well, so this is kind of where we are in Galatia. Galatians. We've got Jewish Christians, we've got Gentile Christians. And then we've got these Judaizers who have come in. Uh, Some of them have been planted, we think. Um, These are those perverting the gospel, the troublers, the leaven, the Ishmaels. They're the kind of descriptions given to this this group within the epistle. And then they're persecuting these two groups so that that they might bring them back into um, bondage. And John 12 confirms this in the ESV. It says, nevertheless, many believed... So many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. And so we have all the way through this underlying kind of subtle theme that there was persecution going on all the way through the Ecclesia to bring people back to Moses uh, and back to circumcision, back to what the Jews were comfortable with, that which allowed their elitism to, to carry on. But when we go through, um, through Galatians, there's a key word that keeps coming up, and it's a small one. Um, it's the word again. And again, as I said, there's this kind of frustration. Paul's saying, I've, I've been to Galatia, I've converted you all, you're all establishing the truth, and now I'm having to do it all again. He says, chapter 1, verse 9, As we said before, so, I, so say I now again, if any man preach any of the gospel, let him be accursed. And we don't get that a lot in the epistles, but you know, the Spirit through, you know, is saying again, you know, I'm having to do this again. Chapter 2, verse 18, For if I build again, the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Chapter 4, verse 9. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beg your limbs, wherein wherein to ye desire again to be in bondage. And it goes on, chapter 4, verse 19. It says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again. It's this kind of idea that they've gone back into the womb, and for the second time he's now having to give birth to them. And, but he says, I'll, 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 I'll labour until Christ is formed in you. And Paul himself, as we said, was separated from his mother's womb, wasn't he? Chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the freedom, the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Chapter 5, verse 3. For I testify again to every man. And then the final one, chapter 5, verse 21. Speaking of the... The things of the flesh, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past. Says, I'm doing it again. It says, I've already told you things, these things in times past. And now here we are again. You've gone backwards, and now let's go forwards again. It's really the, the crux of, of the epistle. And what is it that the Apostle Paul is actually worried about? I think what he's worried about is, is this, that his preaching to them has been in vain three times in the epistle chapter 2 verse 2 at the end of the the end of verse lest by any means I should have run or had run 
in, in vain. It, there's a concern, that genuine concern, that his preaching to them has been in vain. Chapter 3, verse 4, Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it is yet in vain, he says, All that persecution you've already endured, don't let it be in vain. Continue, carry on in, in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 11, I'm afraid of you, lest I've bestowed upon you labour in, in vain. And that's really the context of, of the epistle. It's pretty uh, much on a knife edge. It's challenging, uh, whichever way the apostle turns. And the structure itself of the epistle is actually fascinating. As we said at the beginning, th- there's one theme that's being developed, which is the unifying of Jew and Gentile under the right fa- on the right foundation uh, and how to deal with that. Uh, and what we find is throughout the epistle, um, seven times we come back to this key theme and it's almost like a discourse is given then we've just given a few words on again back to the background then an allegory is given then an analogy and we keep coming back to these uh, checkpoints that take us back to the reason that the epistle has been written and we won't read these now but we'll, we'll go through them as as we go along and if we wanted to give a structure to the book of galatians um this is kind of what i've sort of felt as i went through i suppose is you've got uh, like the Paul section in chapter 1 and 2, which is all about his conversion, how he dealt in the first century, how he dealt with Peter when Peter refused to eat with the Gentiles, that sort of thing. So chapter 1, verse 1 and 12 that we had read is all about the gospel, isn't it? The one gospel. There is no other gospel. It was taught by God, not man. That's kind of the crux of the first section. Then we move to Paul's new birth, where he's separated from his mother's womb, and, and God's son is revealed in him. This key theme of... of of showing God, manifesting God in in our lives, which comes through strongly in the back end of chapter 1. And then we come to chapter 2, which is kind of, uh, I guess, a narrative on on Paul's new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he deal with circumcision with Titus? You know, that's that's what chapter 2 starts with. How did he deal with Peter, who refuses to eat with the Gentiles? Uh, And then we start again in chapter 3, but this time it's not Paul, it's all about the Galatians. Chapter 3 is all about the gospel preached to Abraham. And what that's all about. And how it's exactly the same as the gospel that the Apostle Paul learnt in Arabia in chapter 1 from the Lord. We then have the Galatians' new birth in chapter 4, which mirrors Paul's birth. Chapter 4, verse 19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ is formed in you. That's the same as Paul being called from his mother's womb, isn't it? And then chapter 5 and 6 is the, the, the more practical exhortation of living a life in Christ. Of what that all means. To, to both the Jew and the Gentile converts. <coughs> and if we to go into more detail, um, don't worry about this. Um, you probably can't read it anyway. Uh, but but the, the point I'm trying to make here is, in yellow, we just have these checkpoints that we keep coming back to where we, we go back to the purpose of the epistle. And then we go off on a tangent to, with an, ana- an, an analogy. And then we come back and then we go uh, to an allegory. And then we come back and then we go to some practical exhortation. You can see we just keep coming back. So there's only one thing being dealt with. It's just dealt with in many different ways and we keep coming back to uh, the same point. And you can see that the talks pretty much follow um, what we're going to do. And again, you can just see there, this is all about Paul in the first two sections and then the rest of it then is about the Galatians and how they were to mirror Paul, uh, mirror his endurance during persecution. Okay, so let's go to chapter one if you're not there. And, and just start to have a little look at this first chapter. So this is all about establishing the foundation on which the ecclesia um, is going to be built. So as we said, there's an immediate problem brought to our attention. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and the apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. There's no greeting. It's not addressed to anyone. Uh, he just says, look, I'm an apostle. The Spirit you know, says, Paul's an apostle, and it's not from man, it's from God. It's straight to the point, very direct. Um, this was the issue. Paul's authority, was it divine or not, is really what they're dealing with in, in the first uh, section. And what we find is, chapter, chapter 1, uh, in terms of its literary structure, is two, um, two structures, two chiasm structures bolted together. And they're quite helpful. Um, the first one, verse 1 to 12, which is all about the, the gospel, the, this one true gospel. And, and it, it, it takes us to the middle point in verse 7, which is really just establishing what the problem is, which is that um, which is not another in terms of the gospel. There's no gospel at all, the original. 
but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. So this is all about the troublers. Achan, that's the problem. Uh, those who have uh, spread the leaven within the ecclesia. And then the second one from chapter 12, sorry, from verse 12 to the end of the chapter, brings us to a middle point, which is the solution to the problem, which is verse 17, which is go to Arabia. Neither went I to Jerusalem, to them that were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. So the first chiasm sets the issue. And then the second one, how to deal with it. You know, the solution was to spend some time, three years for Paul-ish in Arabia. Paul was a troubler. He was a perverter of the gospel until he encountered the Lord and the Lord's doctrine in Arabia. It was Paul's three years in Arabia that taught him the truth, wasn't it? And it was directly from the Lord. It wasn't from man, as he's at pains to say in verse 12. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, I, I, didn't, I wasn't taught the gospel. He says, I received it directly from the Lord Jesus Christ, a direct revelation from Jesus himself. And the problem is that there was some teaching this wrong doctrine, and the solution is the revelation that Paul revealed. So how, how does this get dealt with? Well, the first thing the epistle needs to do um, is to establish Paul's divine authority. So Galatians 1 is Paul's conversion account, but it's not really a conversion account, is it? It's not like Acts 9, 22, 26, where you have the blow-by-blow -blow account of what he did, where he went, who he met, or more importantly, who he didn't meet. It's told in a specific way. And the only thing that the, the Spirit wants us to know from the conversion account in Galatians 1, is that there was no human involvement. There was no human involvement in his teaching, verse 12, that came directly from the Lord in Arabia, and there was no human involvement in his calling. That was the road to Damascus. Again, that was the Lord himself. So both his, his, his calling and his teaching were directly from God. And so... In, in a quite phenomenal way, this chapter 1 establishes Paul's authority. And once that's established, then the truth can be taught, can't it? If they accept, in Galatia, Paul's divine apostleship, his calling and his commission, then they will become Isaacs, not Ishmaels. But first, the authority has to be established because the Judaizers are pulling the rug at the moment from under Paul's feet by teaching a different gospel and by threatening persecution. So, so, so how is this done then? Well, this is really small, sorry. Um, so, so chapter 1, what's the key word again? It's, it's gospel, isn't it? Verse 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you from the grace of Christ into another gospel. And we won't read it, but it's there in verse 7, 8, 9, and 11 as well. And then when you go into chapter 2, where Paul is out there, having been converted in Jerusalem and also in Galatia, the, the same key comes through. Chapter 2, verse 2. And verse 5, verse 7, and verse 14, the basis of truth there is being established. And it goes all the way through into chapter 3, verse 8, where we talks about the gospel um, preached to Abraham. And it's really all about the origin of the teaching, is what Galatians 1 is all about. What's the origin of the gospel? Who is it from? Well, it, it's said in many different ways in the same thing, isn't it? Chapter 1, verse 1, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. And then chapter 1, verse 4, talks about the gospel according to the will of God. Verse 6, you've been called unto the grace of Christ. Verse 7 talks of the, those that would pervert the gospel of Christ. If any man preach any other gospel there in verse 9, you get the point, verse 10. He's not seeking to please men, but to be a servant of God. It's a separation between the human and the divine, is what Galatians 1 is doing for us. Verse 11 talks of the, go the gospel that Paul preached was not after man. And then finally, verse 12. It wasn't received from man, neither taught by man, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. And then chapter 2, verse 6, he says the apostles in Jerusalem added nothing to Paul's teaching. He says there's nothing they added to the teaching because I learned it all in Arabia. It was all there directly from, from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so you can see, this is, all, this is what's been pointed out. It's exactly the same as what, what's told in Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 11, it says, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. It wasn't taught, it wasn't, wasn't learned. 
in, a, in that sense from man. It was committed, it was given, received um, from him. And you see the difference there. It was not after man. It wasn't received from man. And again, uh, Thessalonians 2 verse 13 makes that point. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And a double full stop for no reason. So, so what of the gospel that Paul was preaching then? Was it, you know, where was the origin? It's very clear, isn't it? As we've seen from those verses there. So this is Paul's divine authority then, from his conversion, from his new birth. So Galatians 1 separates the human from the divine, as we've said, from both his calling and also from his teaching. All else is human. So their traditions, their doctrine, their practices were human, but not the gospel preached uh, to Abraham, not the gospel Paul received in Arabia. And so the foundation of the unity of the gospel, which is from God. Uh, and we won't go into inspiration now as a topic, but we have to, don't we, make sure that this is the foundation that the, our ecclesias are built, in, built on. It's really important, isn't it, that this is uncompromising, that there's a solid foundation that we, we build from, that it is the gospel that was uh, given to Paul, that he received and therefore passed on to others. Okay, so... We'll just move on from that. So having established then that the gospel preached to Paul was given to him by God and the Lord Jesus, rather than being taught or logically reasoned. So it lacked human input. And interestingly, you know, as we said, Galatians 1 carries on the theme in two other dimensions, which is his calling and his teaching. So we just want to go through these two things. So how was Paul taught the gospel? And we were kind of, verse 12, there was no human intervention. We've just read that, haven't we? But, but it kind of goes a bit further than that uh, in the epistle in chapter 1. So it says there's no human intervention, there's no synagogue teaching here in Galatians chapter 1. That's not how he learned the gospel. But notice verse 13 to 15 as well. It says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the ecclesia of God and wasted it, and I profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of the fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. That's his conversion account in short form. But notice verse 16. What's the point of verse 16? Well, look, he says, to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. He says, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. He says, I didn't speak to anyone. I didn't speak to any humans. That's not how my teaching, where it came from. He, he went straight to Arabia for those years, as we've said. Verse 17, and I didn't even go to Jerusalem, he says, to those who were apostles before me. I went straight to Arabia, and then I went to Damascus. And then th three years, he says, then I went to Jerusalem, and I saw Peter, and I spent 15 days with him. So three years later, he spends 15 days with Peter. That's his first human interaction from the moment he received um, his teaching from the Lord Jesus. He had brief encounters only with James and Peter. Uh, verse 20. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. After, you can see that's the center of, of this, this piece. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the ecclesias of Judea, which were in Christ. Three years later, unknown to his face. And that's only, you know, you think about, well, the last time we were at Swan, it was three years ago. And that's the period that Paul was absent basically from people, bar the odd uh, meeting here and there. And in that period, he went from being a persecutor to persecuted, to fully understand and know the gospel, to be Christ to the Gentiles. And that came from, from the Lord Jesus. And I'm laboring the point, but, but the epistle labors the point. And it's a really important, because without that foundation, you can't build the Galatian ecclesia. And then verse 23 says, but, had, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us, that was what he was known as, not as Saul of Tarsus, he was known as he which persecuted us. You know, in times past, now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. That was the impact meeting the Lord had on this man. And they glorified God in me. That's the impact of Paul being taught, that not only would he glorify God there in verse 16, 
but he was uh, enabled through his teaching for others to, to do the same thing. And secondly then, Paul's calling. How, what do we see in this? His divine authority. What were they to see when they were learning of Paul's conversion in, in the way in which God called him? What was his mission? What was his calling? How was he called? And I think the answer is that, is that they were supposed to see uh, the suffering servant of Isaiah that became Christ to the Gentiles. He takes on that Isaiah role from the Lord Jesus Christ who has now ascended into heaven. And, and particularly in the Acts 9 account, as soon as Paul is converted, the, Acts 9 is at pains to tell us that he went, uh, and, and verse 23, I think it is of Acts 9, he, he was nearly killed straight away. You know, he became persecuted. Uh, and, and, and you remember how he was told in Acts 9, verse 16, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so the book of Isaiah, look, it has two, two servants, doesn't it? It has the national servant and the individual servant. And when you read through the national servant and the individual servants, you've got the national in chapter 41, 43, 44, 45. And you just pick out commonality that comes through there. This is what God did with the national servant of Israel. He led them by the hand. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. They were chosen. They were called by name. They were called from the womb. And their eyes were open. This is what God did with Israel, with his uh, national servant there in Isaiah. And when we come to the individual servant prophecies in chapter 42 and 49, we see exactly the same thing. Perhaps you'll come with me to Isaiah 42. So the, 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 na the individual servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, went through the same as the national servant. He too was to be led by the hand. Chapter 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles. That's the second one there as well, isn't it? So the Lord Jesus Christ, just like Israel, was led by God's hand and was a light to the Gentiles. They were chosen. Chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, my chosen, in whom my soul delighteth. And, and then we're told that he, that he was called, not just called, but called from the womb. Chapter 49, verse 1. Listen, O Isles, unto me, and hear, hearken ye people from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. Verse 5. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob against him. This is what the Lord was to do. This is what the national servant was to do. But these are the very same six things that are picked up of the Apostle Paul when he is converted. Acts chapter uh, 9 and, and verse 8. There's no, no need to go there if you don't want to. But um, Acts 9 verse 8, we're told there um, that he was led by the hand. And, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand, quoting the servant songs of Isaiah. And they brought him to Damascus. He was to be... A light to the Gentiles, verse 15 of Acts 9. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He was called by name, but he, this is the one, isn't it? This is the one Galatians picks up. He is called from his mother's womb. And, and when the Galatians were reading through this, they were to see the Lord Jesus Christ and the national servant of Israel that the, the Apostle Paul, now the Lord has gone to heaven, he has taken on this role, that he is the suffering servant. This is how he was called. This is why he was called, to become Christ to the Gentiles. And, and now they are going to persecute him, as they persecuted the Lord, as they persecuted the, the servant of, of, of God in, in Israel. And, and just going a step further, just pick up a couple of these things um, on the screen. So Isaiah 49, for, for example, what does it say there? It says, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship. This is the individual servant. This is the Lord Jesus. Because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. And this is quoted then in Acts 9 verse 15. The, the, the Apostle Paul is going to take on this role that the Lord had. That he was going to, he was a chosen vessel unto God now. And he was going to bear God's name before the Gentiles. And kings, he's going to, kings shall see and arise. Princes 
would also worship. And so you can see that this is what God wants the Galatians, and not just the Galatians, but the whole first century ecclesiastes, to see that this was now the gospel to the Gentiles. This is now the apostle to the Gentiles, coming in as God's suffering servant. Isaiah 51, verse 16, this is exactly what we've been saying this whole session. And I have put my words in thy mouth. If this is what Galatians 1 is all about, his conversion, God putting through the direct revelation of the Lord Jesus, God's words into his mouth. Three years in Arabia, this was God to man. This had no intermediary. This was straight from God to man. The same as the Lord Jesus. What does he say in John several times? These are not my words, but the Father who has given them to me. This is what this suffering servant was to be. He was to be God and the Lord Jesus to, to these Gentiles. You know, I, we could carry on. Isaiah 49 verse 6 says of the Lord Jesus, he would be a light to the Gentiles. And that's quoted of the Lord in Luke 2 verse 29 to 32, isn't it? A light to light in the Gentiles and the glory of, of thy people Israel. But then when we come to Acts 13, the Lord has gone to heaven. Who is it that's going to take on this role? Well, it's the Apostle Paul, isn't it? And it says there, Paul, well, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles, for so hath the Lord commanded us, not the suffering servant, not the Lord Jesus, but us, he says. We are taking on that role, saying, I have set thee, Paul and Barnabas, to be a light to the Gentiles. This is what the Galatians were to see from the conversion of Paul. They were to see the Lord Jesus Christ and, and his, his conversion and, and the way in which it was done. I probably ought to stop, really. But you know, Isaiah 53, here is the suffering servant that you know well, used of Acts cha in chapter 8 at, at the Ethiopian eunuch's conversion. <coughs> and notice how it's all interpreted by that one phrase in Acts 8. He preached unto him Jesus. So that was a summary of Isaiah 53. I'm preaching unto you, Jesus. And then when we come to Acts 9, verse 16, this is what the Apostle Paul was to endure. He was to be, he was to be that, 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 that suffering servant. For I will show him how great things he must suffer um, for my name's sake. We're running out of time, so I'm just going to leave this. If you go through Isaiah 49 and, and 52 and 3, you'll see how the Apostle Paul's story comes through those servant songs. So, imagine that you are then the audience now in Galatia. You're partway through chapter 1, and it's been proven beyond doubt, or beyond reasonable doubt, if you want to be legal, that Paul was taught by a risen Christ rather than by humans. You have seen the, the apostles' incredible U-turn from a persecutor to a persecuted man, from, Isaac, from Ishmael to Isaac. You've seen God approve him as his suffering servant, who would be a light to the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. And in, and, and in some way, he was Christ to them. And all you have to do is believe in this, in the risen Lord Jesus. You too have to accept and endure persecution. That's the message of Galatians. And you have to be willing to be this servant. That was their calling, wasn't it? It was important that Christ was that individual servant. The, the apostle became that individual servant. And they too now were experiencing that same persecution at the hands of the Judaizers. But, but the message to them was clear, wasn't it? The blessings that come to, to, to the suffering servant, that he is God's chosen. That it was a rallying call for them to endure and to rejoice in their persecution. Ishmael forever will persecute Isaac. It was not going to go away. It's the same in our day, in a different form perhaps. So this is Paul's divine authority. He was sent by God as a chosen vessel. But notice you know, the subject, called from his mother's womb. We've seen that all the way through, haven't we? This, all the way through the servant songs, there's this, this phrase that comes up that he was called from the mother's womb, picked up in Galatians 1. And when you go to, you know, this, this isn't the only place, but you know, the conversion of Jeremiah, he, he's told the same, isn't he, when he is brought in, into his mission. Thus saith the Lord, Jeremiah 1 verse 5, one, oh, that's chapter 2. Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Behold, I formed thee in the belly. I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto, unto the nations. And all the way through Jeremiah 1, you just see Galatians 1. That, that, that he received a direct revelation from God as, as the Apostle Paul had. That he was separated through a prophetic office. That God's words were put in his mouth. That he was a prophet to the nations, not the Jews, predominantly. 
that he would encounter internal strife, that he too would come against princes and kings. And so, and so the Apostle Paul, as he went through this, as the Galatians were reading and understanding this, they would see Jeremiah. They would see that he too was called from the womb. And what was important was God's calling to these men out of the womb to a new life in Christ, a new birth, a new mission as a prophet and an apostle to God. All their earthly credentials have now gone away. You know, the, uh, he was of the greatest stock, wasn't he, the Apostle Paul? But Jeremiah was the same. We read in Jeremiah 1, verse 1. This is what he could claim. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. It doesn't get much better than that. But God, God cast that to one side, as he did with the Apostle Paul and his upbringing, and now creates them into these great apostles. And so this birth analogy keeps coming through, doesn't it? And which is really what the back end of chapter 1 and chapter 4 are all about there. We have it there, predominantly there. And you'll remember, won't you, uh, in Galatians 1.15, he was separated from his mother's womb. But you remember the words of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8 regarding Paul's conversion. At last, uh, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. And it's a deliberate use of, of the word. He was born out of due time. That's what this chapter one of, of Galatians is all about. So I just want to conclude on this theme of um, this new birth. What are we to learn from this new birth? What exaltation is there for us? We are the same. We are born again creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's easy to turn back. That's chapter one, verse six. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him who called you. It's easy to turn back. It's easy to be drawn in, isn't it, by a crowd, particularly when persecution is, is prevalent. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He says, I die daily. And if we die daily, then of course we must be born daily as well. We die to the world every day. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, yet I live. And we, we are to be born daily in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this, this gospel calling that the Apostle Paul had, the gospel calling we have had, is not a once-in-a-lifetime call, is it? It's a daily call for us to follow in its ways. And if you're to understand what being born again means, you, you probably go to the first of John, uh, because it, it, it uses this phrase seven times. And, and we're not going to read through them. Um, in John. But, but these are the, the six, I should say. The, this is the, the sixth summary of, of what it means to be born again, uh, according to the Spirit in 1 John. The first one there, 1 John 2, verse 29, is to do righteousness. Chapter 3, verse 9, to be born again means to sin not. Chapter 4, verse 7, to love one another. To believe that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. To overcome the world by faith and then to keep yourself from the wicked one. And John 3 says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And, and this was this birth that comes through in Galatians 1. And John 1 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. And, and that's the theme, isn't it, in Galatians? This was not from man. This was from God. And so we just finish with our final theme, which comes through the epistle there, which is our overarching theme for the week, isn't it? Taken from Galatians 1, verse 16. This idea of a new birth is all so that God might be glorified, that he might be manifested in the Galatian ecclesias. Chapter 1, verse 16. The whole purpose of Paul's new birth was that God's Son might be revealed in him, that he might preach to the heathen. It comes up again, doesn't it, in chapter 1, verse 24 that they now, in Galatia, were glorifying God in him. When they had seen that he which persecuted is now converted and is being persecuted, they then glorified, not Paul, they glorified God in him. That's a really important principle, isn't it? That God was glorified through Paul. In me is that phrase there. And it comes up again in Galatians 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we'll see this later in the week, but Galatians 4. My little children, whom I travail in birth with you again until Christ is formed in you. And so we'll just finish 
Um, we'll, we'll come back to that later. The whole purpose of what Paul was trying to build here in Galatia was a temple for God, wasn't it? A house that would be exceedingly magnificent, which means to cause to magnify, to cause to glorify. And that's what Paul's conversion was, to build the ecclesia. He was causing them to glorify God. They glorified God in me. And so what we've seen in chapter 1, I think, is, is that once the true gospel is preached, the new birth can take place. And once the new birth has taken place, God can be manifested in that individual, in that person. And then from then, others can come into, into that cycle of, of manifesting God. All the way through, persecution is taking place. And we'll see exactly the same in chapter 3 to 6. Their conversion journey is going to mirror exactly Paul's conversion journey. They're going to be given the true gospel, the gospel preached to Abraham. They're going to go through a new birth. And Paul's the one, he's the mother. He's the one who's going to give birth to them. He doesn't know if it's Isaac or Ishmael, but he's about to find out. And so they would then manifest God in their lives and cause others to do the same. And Colossians says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm-hmm.